Uh, good morning. Uh, I'm David Martin from Argonne <laughs> National Lab, along with Susie Tishner from Oak Ridge. Uh, we lead the ECP Industry and Agency Council. So it's a council made up of senior leaders from both US industry and uh, select US federal, federal agencies um, that advise the ECP management and leadership, but also kind of act as, as a conduit for things like this to get the word out about ECP, and in this case, E4S. Um, this is a follow-on of a session that was at the ECP annual meeting that was popular, and we got a lot of feedback from our members that this would be valuable. So we appreciate you being here. And Susie, you want to say a few words? Sure, great. Uh, hello, everybody. And I'm looking at the participants list and see a lot of familiar names. We're really delighted that you're here. And first, I'd like to really say thank you to Samir uh, Shende, who is the E4S technical lead. Thank you, Samir, for your willingness to conduct this today. And of course, to Mike Haru, who is the director for ECP Software Technology. Thanks very much for your support, Mike. We greatly appreciate it. Um, I'd also like to introduce um, Asni Marcus, who's on here. You'll see him in the participants list. Uh, Asni and uh, Ashley Barker, who will be popping in maybe periodically, they have a very large role in ECP. They manage all the training. And so thank you, Asni, uh, for helping us get this set up and, and for being here today. If anyone has any technical issues uh, during the session, um, just put those, if you can, in the chat and Asni uh, will be here to take care of it. Uh, one thing I did wanna mention about the agenda, particularly tomorrow, We've set aside an hour to start off with Q&A. Uh, so you can ask questions of particularly Mike who will return in the morning, but also Samir. But if we don't use that entire hour for Q&A, we're gonna jump right in then to the tutorial. So don't think that you can skip the Q&A and then come in you know, after the first hour because you might actually be behind. We encourage you to come to the Q&A uh, because uh, we may actually get started a little bit earlier. And on that, I think we will turn it over to Samir and Mike. Thank you, Shall Susie. Um, Samir, do you have anything you wanna say before we start get started? Thank you very much, Susie. And let's just uh, start with the slides and we'll have the hands-on after that. Right. Yeah, and, and I also, yeah, and I want to introduce uh, Lois Kerfman McGinnis, who's the deputy uh, director of software technology. She's here as well, and uh, and you know, the, between the two of us, we do a lot of brainstorming on the you know the future of our activities and related to software, scientific software, and she's been a huge part of the, the laying the groundwork for what we're doing uh, here, especially in the math libraries SDK. Um, work the XSDK. So it's great to have Lois uh, here as well. All right, uh, let's get started. Uh, I'm going to share my screen uh, slides here quick. And um, uh, I, I like in general to, uh, you know, have people, if you have a question, I, I think Gosney will be monitoring chat. So if you want to type a question in, that's fine. If you want to raise your hand, um, you know, it, whatever approach you want to use or just speak up, that's fine with me as well. We're a small enough group that that shouldn't be uh, uh, disruptive. And so um, please, you know, at, as questions or comments arise, I, I would encourage you to ask at the moment if, if that's uh, if you're comfortable doing that. All right. Uh, do you see the right page? Yes. Great. Thank you. All right. So. Uh, all right, so thank you everybody for attending. Uh, hopefully this will be worth your time. Um, so we're going to talk today about the Extreme Scale Scientific Software Stack, or E4S, um, uh, which is a, a, a really a fundamentally new element of the high-performance high computing uh, software ecosystem. We're really excited about um, the opportunity that the Exascale Computing Project has provided, all, you know, all the right elements to you know, both in terms of time, you know, the span of time we have, you know, multiple years, um, you know, cross institutional, you know, a very clear objective for what the project should be doing, um, you know, a big portfolio of reusable software that we have to somehow get our arms around and create a portfolio of, and and guide it 
and then you know what we're seeing increasingly is that what what's been created you know, to, to service the specific needs of the exascale computing project at this time uh, has sustainable value. And we, we foresee if, if we do things well and we were trying our best, that E4S is going to live long past, uh, you know, the time span of ECP and become a lot lasting legacy of what the exascale project has provide, provided. And so we're here today to give you an overview of it. You, know, you kick the tires, give us feedback, so that we can improve what we're doing and uh, begin a, a dialogue with you. So let's get started. Uh, so just a brief introduction to the Exascale project itself, um, ECP. Um, so EC ECP is a you know, holistic approach to using, using co-design integration to achieve Exascale. We're, we're you know, in coordination with the facilities, uh, creating these platforms and then creating the software in collaboration with the vendors um, and facilities and the application teams uh, that will execute on these platforms and show the value of the investment we've made in these systems. Um, there are three focus areas. Application development is one, which is a collection of application uh, teams. Many of these are codes that were around or had, had predecessors, but that are now being substantially redone to realize the performance benefits of these exascale platforms, in particular GPUs, and not just NVIDIA, but Intel and AMD. And so one of the legacies of the exascale project will be this software stack, including a collection of applications that can run really well across a broad set of GPU accelerated architectures. Uh, the, another area is hardware and integration. Uh, which provides, um, you know, they, they, they were involved in what's called the Path Forward Program, which was a very successful early phase of the Exascale project. And now they are primarily in, uh, allowing us and supporting the application and software teams in collaboration with the facilities and with the vendors to make sure that we're all doing, uh, pulling in the same direction and doing our work together. Uh, and are well informed about each other's activities. And then I'm gonna to talk today about the software technology area, which is the, is the area of ECP that sponsors E4S. And so we'll talk a little bit about that uh, as we go forward right now. Um, so these are the platforms, the roadmap of the systems that uh, we're far, uh, focusing on. Uh, Perlmutter is being installed now. It's an NVIDIA-based system. It's not one of our target systems, but we look forward to having it and using it because it's a really nice uh, uh, staging platform for the work that we're doing as a summit that's at uh, Oak Ridge right now. Uh, but the three exascale systems are Frontier, which is an AMD-based, you know, GPU-based system, Aurora, which is an Intel GPU-based system, and then later on, El Capitan, which will be similar to what the Oak Ridge Frontier system is. And so these are our targets. This is, these are the systems that we have to uh, show and demonstrate our, our capabilities on uh, as we approach the, the end of the Exascale project. Okay, a little bit of, of uh, the ST software technology area. Uh, one of the three focus areas, um, the one that Lois and I lead and the Samir participates in as a technical lead for E4S. Um, so we're, we're not trying to go out and, and, and be revolutionary in all ways. Uh, that doesn't make sense for what we're trying to do. What we're trying instead is to prepare a software stack that it needs uh, supports massive on no parallelism. That's the requirement for Exascale. We're extending existing capabilities when possible and developing new when not. Uh, we're part of a much bigger ecosystem. And so we're guiding, complementing and integrating with vendor and facilities efforts. And something we are doing, and this is really what E4S is about, is, is developing and delivering higher quality than perhaps in the past we have, you know, in robust software products in a curated way. There, there are some really nice opportunities, you know, with, with um, you know, development platforms like GitHub and GitLab uh, with tools like containers and SPAC to, to raise our game. Uh, and then also as communities uh, to be able to collaborate with each other to improve the quality of the work that we're doing and improve its complementarity and collaboration. 
Uh, I won't go into detail, but the, we, you know, underneath, so we have ECP, we have the three focus areas, ST is one of them, and then within ST, there are these six technical areas. I'm not going to go into detail, but just so you can kind of see, you know, the kinds of technologies we're investing in, programming models and runtimes, development tools, math libraries, data and viz, and then we have this very nice special relationship with the NNSA uh, laboratories, um, where a lot of work is being done that is open source, um, it's vertically integrated, and so we have it in a special uh, level three area, our, our term for the next level, that current level. Um, and so that is being uh, collaboratively developed with the, with the uh, Science Lab Act, uh, uh, sponsored work and a very nice arrangement there. And then, um, and then the software ecosystem areas where E4S lives, and, and this is... Um, you know, where we're developing container-based technologies, the SPAC work is being done, um, and all of the efforts to uh, package and deliver our software capabilities to ECP and the broader community. <clears throat> what do we work on? Well, we work on a lot of things that if you're involved in the HPC community, um, that you're, you're, you've seen, you know, MPI, for example, but our focus is on these GPU architectures and advanced memory and storage technologies uh, in creating high concurrency, latency tolerant algorithms. Uh, a lot of the innovation that's been done in terms of algorithmic work is all about hiding latency and exposing concurrency. The, each GPU on its own right is a multi tera op device. And so you have to have lots of parallelism available in order to take advantage of the performance potential. Um, you know, the, the portability across GPUs, in fact, this will be the, you know, one of the big legacies is this portability across multiple GPU uh, platforms. And that's good for everybody. Uh, it's good for the industry as a whole to have that competition. Um, and it's good for us to be able to uh, have access to a lot of different vendor products. Uh, <clears throat> so we have MPIs, uh, MPI CH. Open MPI, if you're using math libraries, you've probably heard of Petsy as an example. So we're building the next generation of these capabilities. Um, other products are things like Cocos and Raja and Spac. Uh, we're, not, we're, we're not necessarily household HPC names when ECP got started, but have emerged as being essential you know, to our efforts going, you know, going forward and have in a sense become very popular as a set of tools. And then we have newer things that you probably still haven't heard of yet, but we anticipate will be widely used. Things like the simple interface to complex memory, uh, ZFP, which is a compression, in-memory compression library, and Unify CR, which uh, uh, supports uh, uh, low latency IO offload capabilities. And then this is kind of, and then the rest of the example products here give you a sense of the kinds of things that we're working on. So we're, we're not doing esoteric stuff. We're doing stuff that's really essential to getting applications up and running on existing and emerging platforms. I wanted to talk a little bit about our progress towards exascale readiness, just so you get a sense of the kind of deep technical work that's going on in the project. Um, all of the theme here is about preparing capabilities that run across multiple platforms. So the slate is our dense linear algebra effort uh, being worked on at the University of Tennessee primarily. And, and Slate is a collection of, of things like uh, dense linear system solvers, least squares, eigenvalue solvers, SVD. So this is the kind of things that you would find in BLAS and LAPAC, uh, SCALAPAC. Um, which if, you, if you've used any math libraries at all, you probably use these uh, libraries. Now, um, how this work happens is we often do design space exploration and the vendors pay attention to that and they read the papers, they'll try out our software and often they'll take the, the uh, knowledge that was gained from our explorations and then integrate that into their own vendor supported libraries. But it's also really important to have our libraries available across all these platforms. And so you'll see you know, with Slate that we're porting to NVIDIA, that's been around for quite some time, but now the Rockham stack, which is the AMD stack, and then one API, which is the Intel stack. And, and that's a theme of a lot of our work is this, this portability across uh, the, the three target accelerator platforms. Similarly for Cocos, uh, Cocos provides a parallel forward uh, reduce and scan uh, execution pattern, so which is almost all loops uh, in a lot of scientific codes. Uh, and, and by integrating this, this execution pattern along with a loop body, what, what needs to get done, 
Um, you can express lots of scientific computations uh, in a way that will be uh, portably uh, compiled to the target backend that you're running on. So it's a way of writing code one time and then having code generated in a performance uh, optimal way for lots of different backends. So this is just, and Raja is another one. Raja has some nice features um, as well. And, and so both of these are products that provide that kind of performance portability um, through uh, standard interfaces, the library type capabilities. Uh, another uh, is in FFTs where we've taken um, existing application FFT, you know, ad hoc libraries, understood what performance and, and uh, functionality they provide, and then have collected that into a library called Hefty. And Hefty has then been able to take these kind of um, you know, application-based libraries, make them more sustainable and reusable in, a, in a, a standalone library, and then focus on the really important part, which is optimization across nodes, um, because it's, it's possible to get really good performance for a local FFT computation on a device, but it's the scalability challenge comes from having to go across multiple nodes. And so the Hefty team have invested in uh, things like uh, 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 lower precision data types that uh, allow faster, higher bandwidth, lower latency uh, execution across multiple nodes. Uh, and again, also then across the uh, multiple GPU architectures. Um, let's see, I see, is there a thing in the chat there? Should I take a look at that? Oh, okay, never mind. I'll keep going. Um, so anyway, just a, so th th that's just a kind of a flavoring of what's in the ST uh, efforts deeply and technically. Um, so we're creating these new algorithms that expose and exploit massive unknown parallelism in addition to MPI. Um, we're support expanding to support all the target GPU architectures. And as a result and of the complexity of the hardware ecosystem, um, many more application teams are depending increasingly on the libraries and tools that we're providing and others as well, uh, because it's much harder nowadays to uh, write all your own code and target all of these different architectures. It, it's, it's business in a business sense, it makes sense to rely more heavily on uh, reusable software products, third-party libraries and tools that other people provide. Now, in order to make that, to realize the benefit of that, though we have to really focus on improved quality. And that's where E4S and the focus of quality that the Exascale project team um, has, has developed, it comes in. Okay, let's talk a little bit about uh, getting portable performance via E4S, because I think that's uh, what a lot of people are looking for when they look toward, you know, the Exascale project and what it could bring to their organization is, how am I going to get performance out of these next generation of platforms, even if I'm not running on Frontier or Aurora, I may be running on a, you know, a departmental cluster or even a, you know, a desk side system that has these similar GPUs. Um, so the challenge that in, in these cases is that you have two goals. You want to get performance and you want to get portability. You want to get the most uh, of the per potential performance and, and how much you know, you're willing to uh, get, you know, to give up, say, for portability, you know, and get performance is varies with the specific situation. Um, you know, if it's a really intense kernel, you may want to customize that build or that the, that for each of the target architectures. Whereas maybe it's something that's that needs to run well but doesn't run to run at the very peak uh, speed. You can get by with a, a portability layer, um, and so that varies from from team to team or situation to situation. Uh, and then similarly, portability. You know, to minimize how much special code you need to write. Uh, so examples, you know, if you use Cocos to write your parallel loops, uh, you get performance a lot across a lot of multiple platforms, uh, and you can target all of these different architectures. If you use Petsy to solve large, large sparse, sparse linear systems, um, Petsy runs well on G CPUs and GPUs, but it's it's under the the hood that you that that happens, and from your point of view, 
um, you're using that library to take care of the details of executing well on a particular platform. Uh, one of the key things that you as a user will need to, if you're using a library like Petsy, is it's very likely that if you assemble a sparse linear system, say from finite elements, stiffness matrices, uh, for example, that you will also need to get that code to run on the GPU. Fortunately, by using something like Cocos, um, you can do that and, and then feed that data right into Petsy and have Petsy use the data that you constructed on the GPU to also then solve the linear system on the GPU. So how might you write your code for portable performance? Uh, there's certainly OpenMP. OpenMP has been a standard that's around for a long time. Uh, in the recent past, they've added a, a, what's called a target offload, which means you can specify by markup that data and computation should be migrated to a, a, a target device, you know, in this case, a, a GPU. In our experience, uh, OpenMP is directly used primarily by Fortran applications, not so much for C++. And in fact, we've seen you know, not a complete migration by any sense, but uh, you know, a, a fair migration of from Fortran to C++ among the application teams that are part of the Exascale project. And then those teams that are using C++ are generally not using OpenMP directly. Um, they may use it via Cocos or Raja, but they don't call open it or in, introduce OpenMP directly into their code. Um, another way of, of writing parallel code is to use CUDA or HIP or SICL, uh, which are, which are um, you know, extensions to you know, C and C++ primarily. Uh, CUDA, of course, is NVIDIA's uh, special language, a very successful approach. HIP is very similar to CUDA and is intended to be portable across um, uh, you know, uh, NVIDIA and AMD hardware. In, in practice, it's, you know, it doesn't always work as well as CUDA on, in our experience on NVIDIA hardware. Um, uh, and, and, and so it's, you know, it, it's really AMD solution, um, you know, with possibilities of being used elsewhere. Same thing with Sickle. Um, you know, it, it's um, Intel sponsors that and it's intended to be an open standard, you know, but we find that, um, you know, it, it's harder to necessarily get a, a full portable solution out of any one of these three uh, uh, approaches. And so you end up writing a fair bit of, of system specific code if you go with those. Um, now that might be okay for you because maybe you just have a small amount of code that needs to be written in CUDA and in HIP and in SICL and that could be a reasonable approach. And then the third part approach I mentioned is Cocos and Raja. You know, which I'll, I'll, I'll use language extensions in C++ to allow you to write standard C++ code and then have the compiler emit uh, code that is specific to a particular backend. And so these are three different ways and, and which one you would use depends a lot on your particular situation, but these are three credible approaches to, for you to write your own code to uh, work uh, in parallel and be portable. Uh, you can also use libraries, as I mentioned, the uh, BLAS and LAPAC capabilities, FFTs, and sparse linear algebra. We're doing quite a bit of work in sparse linear algebra um, in sparse direct solvers, uh, such as SuperLU and StrumPack. Uh, those are essentially direct solvers, but there's a, some iteration now that's being used in particular in StrumPack. But those are intended to solve you know, modest size linear systems for example, if you're doing a domain decomposition type of a, a problem, uh, you may do a sub uh, set or a subgrid of the problem using something like SuperLU and StrumPack as part of a larger global preconditioner. And then in the sparse iterative Petsy and the Trilinos and Cocos kernels are options. Um, and again, as I mentioned, the key thing is you're gonna have to move your problem construction also to the GPU. And that's something we can help you with by giving you portability layers like Cocos and Raja, um, but the code generally has to be written by you in order to get that to get onto the GPU. And then just a little bit about IO bottlenecks, um, and that's HDF5. We have continued evolution of that for modern platforms. If you're familiar, the vol layer is one of our bigger efforts uh, in HDF5. 
Uh, and then Audios is an alternative customizable library. It's also becoming available via the HDF5 API. So if you're already using HDF5, you'd be able to use Audios via that same interface. And then efforts in data compression with Veloce SZ. Um, and, and these are in-memory uh, types of data compression because the, the disparity between compute performance and I.O. performance continues to grow you know, with Exascale as it has for quite some time. And so one of the approaches that people increasingly use is to, to compress data in memory so that there's less that has to be written out or even work with data in memory so you don't write it out. And, and so these are other ways that we're trying to help the community as a whole. Um, you know, address the challenges of exascale systems. Okay, I'd like to talk a little bit about the growing complexity of scientific ap application software. Um, so the challenge is as our software gets more complex, it's harder to install tools and libraries correctly and integrate in an interoperable software stack. You know, this is, uh, we, we keep a database uh, with, for, with the, for the Exascale project, keeping track of which applications use which ST products, software technology products. So who uses MPI, you know, who uses Petsy? Uh, these are examples. And we know exactly which applications uh, need those libraries. So we can keep track of who is impacted by our progress, or maybe if we slow down or delayed a bit, who's going to be impacted by that. But we also keep track of software technology dependencies on each other because some of the tools and libraries we provide use each other's tools uh, as a part of their overall suite. Um, there's a paper um, that we recently, that, that Lois uh, is the lead author on, on community software ecosystems. And, and this and it's in the first issue of Nature Computational Science. And it, it, it explains kind of our vision for how communities as a whole should could start thinking about using software ecosystems and embrace them more firmly as a way to address ongoing challenges of these very advanced and complicated computer systems that we're building today. So as I said, software is becoming more complex. Um, you know, this is Nalu, which is one of the a code used for the Exawin, the wind farm uh, modeling and simulation project within ECP. The, these are some of its dependencies. Um, this is DL2, which is a, a popular finite element library and all of its dependencies. Uh, this is R minor, okay, a data mining library and all of its dependencies. Um, and then even if you have a prior proprietary code, Aries is a proprietary code, you can see um, that there are lots of dependencies, you know, and um, more than half of the dependencies are in fact open source uh, software products. And all of these are needed in order to build uh, an HPC uh, application. And us, you know, within the Exascale project, it, it's actually much more than 15 applications, but just to keep the math a little simple, you know, 15 plus applications, 80 plus 70, which are official products of ours, uh, times the target architectures, because yes, we want to run NVIDIA and, and uh, Xeon and uh, AMD, but also laptops and other things. And then a bunch of different compilers that we track, uh, and then all of the different programming models that we support. And then we need two to three versions depending on external dependencies. And then if you take that and do all the arithmetic, it's a lot of combinations. And so it's a really quite a combinatorial explosion of capabilities that we need. Um, every application has its own stack. Um, lots of different developers and users are, are dedicated to porting and building. And we often trade off reuse and usability for performance. And so we have to make it easier. And so how we do that um, in the past has been you download, let's say you have 16 uh, uh, third-party dependencies. You download them, you start building, right? You start your build, you start your build, you know, configure, make, play with the compiler, make, tweak the configure args, make, install, configure, make, make, install, see, make, 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 install, right? And you get to the end and you run the code and it seg faults and you start over. Um, so how can we try to address this issue? Uh, well, you can try modules, um, but modules are only part of the answer. You, um, you can do a module avail, see what's out there, do a module load, uh, you know, add to uh, your environment, but they don't really handle the installation. 
And so uh, we need the ability to still install things so that modules can be effective too. Um, and then this is where SPAC comes in and why we've become quite enamored of SPAC is it provides a, a really nice holistic solution to a, a challenge that we've been facing for many years. Uh, so SPAC is used by E4S as a package manager for software delivery. Um, it's a build layer, not only for E4S, but all the things that we depend upon. So it manages all the dependencies of E4S as well. And you can get to SPAC by going to SPAC.io. It's a flexible package manager. You can, in, you can install it yourself. Um, and then you, once you install it, you can use it to install other things. So you could do SPAC install Tau, for example. Uh, and you can use different compilers, different MPI implementations, different build options. Um, it, it provides a spec syntax uh, to describe custom configuration. So you can just do spec install tau. You can say uh, at a particular version, uh, you can a particular version with a particular compiler. Uh, you can specify a particular API. Uh, and then you can also provide a special uh, a wrapper path for the MPI that you want to use. And so all of these clauses are, you know, in combination can be used uh, to be more and more specific about what you want SPAC to do. Uh, if you look at like a SPAC find, we'll show what's installed. Um, and so uh, this is just a screenshot of a particular instance of it. You know, all these versions coexist, and so you can have multiple versions of the same package. Uh, they're installed automatically to find correct dependencies, and the binaries work regardless of the user environment. Um, and it also generates module files. You don't have to use them, but they're available. The SPAC community is growing rapidly. Um, lots of people are coming to depend upon it as a meta build tool. And, and just to be clear, SPAC doesn't replace configure make. Uh, it doesn't replace CMake. Instead, it, it sits on top of them and allows you to specify how to build your product and then also allows you to specify what things you depend upon and so that, if, that there should be then spec recipes for those things so that they can be built prior to building your product. And so it's a, a, you know, a nice recursive definition of software dependencies that as a whole allows you to build an, a complete software stack. Um, next, I want to talk about software uh, architecture, uh, the, the SDKs that are part of our, of our effort. Um, uh, ECP applications depend on lots of ST products. Um, so these, these are just five applications, Exawind I mentioned, uh, Subsurface is uh, an, another application for carbon capture, fossil fuel extraction, waste disposable, you know, disposal, so it allows modeling and simulation of, of under the earth's you know, crust or part of the, you know, that layer. Uh, WDM app uh, is whole device modeling, Exasky is a cosmology, cosmology project, and then Marble is a multi-physics code. Um, and, and if you look at these codes and what they depend on, you can see that all of them use MPI. Some of them use Coco, some use Raja, Chai, Umpire. Uh, and then in the tools and technology area, again, multiple uh, users of these capabilities. And so th this, real, this, this reality is that, um, you know, the applications use you know the reusable tools that are underneath that these software technology products and that these products can in a sense be grouped by functionality and by community inspires our efforts to do to create software development kits um, the most uh, widely used one and and the longest term one is the math libraries sdk or sometimes they're called the x sdk and by having these SDKs, what we're enabling is community development. Um, teams that are developing similar and complementary capabilities like math libraries, they talk the same language, they understand, understand the same algorithmic uh, domains and having them work together is very powerful. It creates collaboration, uh, deeper awareness of each other's work. Uh, they can more easily uh, create uh, complementarity and call each other's capabilities. Um, and, and things like uh, tutorials. It's now pretty common for the math libraries that there's not just a hyper 
uh, tutorial for the hyper library or Petsy Tao. There's there's an XSDK tutorial which then goes deeply into each of them by cover, but but also covering the general concepts of how to use math libraries that are common across. And so we're taking this SDK. Uh, uh, strategy and expanding it to the entire ST portfolio to create multiple kinds of, of uh, SDKs. And so this is just an example or evolving exactly what the SDK uh, factoring of the product space would look like. But you can see here that you know that you know, the PMR programming models and runtime compiler and support tools and technologies, XSDK or math libraries, you know, Viz and so on. These are the groupings of these products that allow teams to collaborate with each other. They still have their own product development, right? They're still independent in their planning and activities and technology development, but they're part of a larger community of like-minded people. And that creates value uh, as we've observed over the past several years with the math libraries SDK effort. And so using the SDKs, we can do this development effort, cooperative, collaborative development across each of the domains, math libraries, data and viz, programming models. And then we can take those SDKs and hoist them up into E4S. And that is the overall uh, uh, build and delivery of product that we provide. Um, and as I mentioned, here is the XSDK, the math libraries. The XSDK started with uh, you know, four math, general purpose math libraries, Hyper, Petsy, SuperLU, and Trulino. So it's now expanded to be more than 20, including from uh, different funding sources, the NSF, National Science Foundation, and even from the international community. Uh, FIST, PHIST, in the lower part of the list is developed by the German Aerospace uh, or DLR. Um, and, and so as long as they are complementary and can satisfy our quality requirements, what we call community policies, they can be a part of this, this, this SDK. And, and so it creates a, a nice ecosystem of domain related capabilities that can enhance the ecosystem overall. Okay, so that's a bit about SDKs. Um, the extreme scale scientific software stack E4S is um, the, the next top level. And so what is E4S? It's a curated SPAC-based software distribution. It has binary build caches for bare uh, metal installs for a bunch of target architectures. Uh, we have container images on Docker Hub and the E4S website. Um, and this is what you'll be using uh, in the hands-on part. Uh, base image and full feature containers, um, you know, GitHub recipes, GitLab integration for built, you know, images, uh, e validation test suite that's growing, a kind of smoke test, if you will. Uh, and then we have the uh, container launch tool that makes it easier for you to switch in the optimized MPI layer uh, for a particular system. So you can take our, our container and then swap in an optimized MPI to get the full performance out of the system. And then a virtual box image that provides support for all of these different uh, container environments. And then AWS and Google Cloud images uh, uh, available of, of E4S. All right, um, so this tells a lot of similar kinds of things, so I'm not gonna go through this one in detail. Uh, um, so let's talk a little bit about what E4S is trying to address. Um, there are three main questions that E4S is trying to address. The first one is actually specifically related to ECP. We have all of this uh, reusable software work going on, and, and how do we manage that? You know, we're making contributions to roughly 70 different products. We can't just have 70 different teams you know, independently you know, uh, working without some notion of how things are going and, and using a portfolio management approach. And so what E4S is doing is it's allowing us to satisfy the, what are called key performance parameters, KPP. There's one of them associated with the software technology area. And so um, E4S allows us to, to establish this curated portfolio of software. So to make sure that we can satisfy our KPP, that will then in turn enable uh, partially the success of ECP as a project. If we don't satisfy our four KPPs of which you know, one is related to our software portfolio, uh, we as a project don't succeed. And so it's very important. So that first question 
uh, is addressing the specific needs of ECP. But in addition, um, we, we are part of a much larger ecosystem. And so E4S allows us to build upon and leverage and extend exist, existing capabilities. And that's why there's this emphasis on SPAC, uh, why we're, you know, emphasis on containers and cloud platforms, you know, why we're integrating a lot of our work into LLVM and into the vendor and facility stacks. And so that's the second question that E4S is trying to address. And the third is how can E4S become a sustainable, open, and collaborative software ecosystem? Which I would argue is you know why we're here today. Uh, you know we want to have this hierarchical, open architecture that can accept and manage community contributions. Uh, we want defined processes that allow us to engage with DOE, other U.S. agencies, industry, and international partners, and develop and deliver the value proposition of this eco ecosystem. You know, versus each application managing its own dependencies. The key thing here is, is as a portfolio, we want to be so much more valuable to the community than if an individual application team were to manage its own dependencies independently from what we're providing. So E4S is our approach to trying to address these questions. Um, we put out now, we're committed to quarterly releases. Uh, we put out the most recent one in May. Uh, there are 76 full product uh, or releases in it. In addition to our own software, uh, we also provide uh, access to things like PyTorch and TensorFlow and Horovod, uh, you know, which are difficult to, to install on leadership platforms. Uh, and then we also have, coming out of the application de uh, development area of ECP, new um, software suites like Amrex, which is an adaptive mesh refinement uh, ecosystem, and then Cabana and MFEM. MFEM is, for example, a finite element uh, capability, which are, which are also reusable products, a little bit higher level, and those are available uh, via E4S. Um, this is what in, is in the May release. 76 products. I just put the names here in, in front of them so you can see what they are. Um, and so we have this ecosystem. We have its three level. The lowest level, ST products, DOE and many other people have been developing, you know, HPC scientific software products for decades, right? We stood up uh, leadership computing systems for decades. We provided things like MPICH. Uh, Petsy for many years, um, that's not brand new. What, what is new there is adapting them to multiple GPU architectures. That's our you know, per product technical challenge is how to do that. But then we're adding these layers of the software development kits, these community-based aggregations that allow independent teams to collaborate with each other as they do their work, learn from each other, make a community commitment to quality. And then on top of that is E4S, which is the holistic product that we're developing that you can, you can grab a copy of or take it, get a container of it and then compile your application against what's there and, and it greatly improve your productivity as a part of that. So um, our commitment with E4S is to uh, towards quality. We're using community policies. I'll show just a little bit uh, our doc portal single access to all the documentation, our portfolio testing, uh, especially on leadership platforms, this curated collection so that you can upgrade confidently you know, to the latest version of a given third party library or, or tool and, and be confident that we've done the work of making sure that everything else is compatible with that. Uh, quarterly releases, the build caches, which we're seeing give you roughly a 10 times uh, uh, improvement in build times, uh, and then the increasingly this turnkey stack, which is a new experience. Um, and then also we're creating strategy uh, discussions, um, both with our DOE partners and other uh, uh, stakeholders, so that we can figure out how to move E4S forward when e once ECP is over. And then everything is available on e4s.io. So a little bit about our commitment to quality, community policies, and practice improvement. If you go to the e4s.io website, you'll see across the top uh, a policies uh, uh, button, and you can click on that. And what you'll see here, there is our, uh, it's a modest list, right? We're just getting started, right? We have nine things, but the the nine things are important, you know, minimal validation testing, um, documentation, 
and so on, public repository. These are all things that are really important for an open source uh, suite. And so um, these policies are a starting point, but they've been agreed upon by all the teams that are part of E4S. So this is our first step, it's version one. You know, you use iteration and incrementation only on projects you want to succeed. That's, uh, I can't remember who said that anymore right off the top of my head, but that's what we're doing here is where, you know, these are accurate, but not precise and they're, they're in, in, essential, but they're not complete. And so we're getting started. We're building a community that, that can uh, recognize policies as a way to drive quality of the products that we're working on. Um, the other way we're trying to drive quality is through a project called Ideas, which I, again also started before ECP started, but has been folded in and funded by ECP um, uh, for a number of years now. And, and what we're trying to do with the Ideas project is to, to pay attention to what is going on in the rest of the, of the broader software world and try to understand methodologies that are being successfully used in the broader software world and try to customize and, customize and curate those for the needs of scientific software. Uh, we're trying to establish software communities um, you know, by these software development kits, um, and then incrementally introduce uh, improved practices into our software teams using what we call PSIP, Productivity and Sustainability Improvement Planning, and then engage with the broader community um, by creating documentation and, and having a site that's called bsSw.io. Uh, and bsSw.io is a portal that provides access to lots of different uh, uh, content that can be used to anybody who wants to improve how they do their scientific software development. We also support um, a fellows program that gives recognition to people who are doing groundbreaking work in scientific software. I mentioned PSIP, I won't go into this in detail, but we were able to with this productivity and sustainable improvement planning, which is essentially an iterative incremental process for improving you know, some aspect of your software uh, life cycle. How you, could, how you conduct your work. And we had a very successful project with the HDF5 effort uh, from the HDF group to improve the, the, how they do their work by using PSIP. I mentioned the fellowship program. We've had a, a lot of success um, giving recognition to people who are doing groundbreaking work in this area. We've had several classes of, of fellows um, and, uh, and so we have, uh, uh, the, the fellowship, and then we've also been able to engage uh, the National Science Foundation to have them help us in the sponsorship of the fellows program. And then finally, I'll mention that um, there's a report that we put out that you can get to with this link uh, on, on all of the latest ideas that we've been working on uh, through the Ideas Project. So the, those two efforts, um, the, the uh, qu commitment to quality through community policies, and then our efforts within the Ideas Project are how we're trying to elevate quality uh, within ECP and particular within E4S. Okay, the doc portal I mentioned a little bit about, but if you go to e4s.io uh, and you click on doc portal, you see this page. Um, what we're providing here is a single point of access to all the products that are part of E4S. Um, and, and by doing that, we're telling people, okay, you don't have to go and do a general search to find out you know, how to, to you know, what license a particular product in E4S has. You can go to this page and we provide that information for you. Uh, it's a searchable page. It's a sortable page. Uh, if you click on one of the products, for example, Audios 2, you'll get a summary page. Now that summary page has been created for you by raking the content on the Audios uh, uh, GitHub site. Uh, if, because all we need in order to create a summary for any one of the products is the URL that points to the repository. Given that URL, we, we rake information from the readme file, from the license file, from the contributing file, and that allows us to, to uh, get the latest information, whatever's on, on the repo or in the repo itself, will be then put into our summary page here for you. 
Uh, and we and we recreate that every day. And so as long as the repo itself is up to date, which the developers you know want to and and should can be committed to doing anyway, we will have the latest information on the E4S site. And then if you look on the summary page and you want to get more detail, it'll bring you right to the audios page. You know, so, so it's our way of providing a single point of access to the basic information about the products in E4S and then still allowing you to get to the details that are there. So these are some examples of how E4S is adding value to more than having just a collection of software. All right, using E4S, uh, you know, from source using SPAC and build caches. Um, so here's the E4S SPAC environment, a SPAC.yaml file. Uh, you can do a bare metal install uh, using this. Um, as I mentioned, um, there's a SPAC build cache, which allows you to, if SPAC has built um, that signature before. So remember, SPAC goes through and builds from the bottom up. It builds all your lower level dependencies that you depend on and maybe that they depend on and eventually gets to build your product. Well, if SPAC has built your tree before all your dependencies and then you come back and rebuild it, let's say you, you know, made a modification or let's say somebody else built the same, built the same uh, dependency that you have, but for a different situation. And if it's sitting in the build cache, if that build is in the build cache, um, SPAC can find it and then pull in that binary and not have to rebuild it. And so it's a way of greatly accelerating uh, the build process, especially for rebuilds. Um, and, and so we've seen with the applications that are using SPAC and in particular for E4S, because we're caching all these builds, as, as the diagram says, there's more than 53,000 binaries. Uh, these are all various combinations of things that have built, been built with specific uh, you know, compiler flags and versions. Um, and if you have these build caches, you can see a dramatic improvement in rebuilds. You know, WDM app sees a speed up of about 10x, Pantheon similarly. And then another 10, 10x because they have smoother installs, they find there are fewer hiccups uh, when they try to rebuild. Um, the latest we've done is ExaWind, this is, which is the wind farm, and Nalu Wind is the application. Uh, they've gone from doing a four hour rebuild uh, to about six minutes. Now they, you know, they niced it, right? So it ran in the background. So I'm sure if they elevated it, that you know, they could get it done quicker. But that that didn't matter because it was still hours. Now instead, they can do a rebuild in about six minutes, and that completely changes your workflow. If you can go from hours to a few minutes, <clears throat> and that's the kind of improvement we're we're excited about uh, that we get from these build caches. Yeah, so that's a little bit about building from source. Uh, then building with containers. Um, uh, first of all, uh, you know, containers, uh, you, in case you don't know, are, you know, are, are lightweight uh, collection of executable software. It encapsulates everything. You know, so if, you're, if you've used virtual machines, you know what they are uh, in a similar way. Um, but, but it allows you to encapsulate an entire software ecosystem collection of, of built, built software and share that or reuse it in a variety of settings. Um, you know, just a little bit of the difference between you know, hypervisors and containers. I'm not gonna go into this, this uh, more of a leave behind slide, um, but you can get uh, E4S container images. I, ha I have in these slides, the older version, I get, didn't get a chance to update them. Um, you know, but this is the, the previous quarterly release, not the May one, but the February one. But you can go and grab uh, uh, container images. And, and this is from, if you go again to e4s.io, which will redirect you to a GitHub uh, location, e4sproject.github.io. But again, it's just e4s.io to get there. Uh, you can grab these container images. And, and this is, again, the February release, but you can see <clears throat> You know, the products that are available um, as part of it, you know, support for GPUs, um, Cocos with support for AMD GPUs. Um, and then um, this is the, the rest of the 67 uh, products. <clears throat> and here's uh, E4S support for singularity containers. Um, this is what you'll be using, right, Samir, for um, uh, later today and tomorrow. 
Is that yes, correct? Yes, we'll be using this container. Yes, exactly. Yeah, so you'll see, you'll be able to kick the tires of this particular one. And again, um, you know, this supports Intel uh, One API. That's the Intel GPU, in particular, CUDA and Rockham. Uh, and then this is uh, the, the PPC 64LE uh, uh, version GPU, um, again, for supporting NVIDIA um, uh, with IBM's uh, uh, front end. And here is uh, for the PPC LE, again, the same product list of what's available. Um, and so this uh, shows you where you can get that particular version of it. And this is a, a you know snapshot then of of you know actually executing this. Um, and Samir, I don't know. Do you want to talk a little bit about this right now, or do you want to wait till it's it time? It just for shows the, that uh, yeah. not only do you have the HPC stack, but you also have a number of Python packages, including TensorFlow, PyTorch, OpenCV, Matplotlib, NumPy. And here I'm just showing the output of uh, is the GPU available, or rather. Is TensorFlow able to access the GPUs through Singularity? And you can see that it shows up with four V100 GPUs that are accessible. It's important to run Singularity with the dash dash NV flag to enable the NVIDIA access to the GPUs. But uh, these uh, stacks have support for the GPUs. This is what the slide's showing. Thanks. Yeah, thank you, sir. Yeah. Um, and then, uh, so this shows the uh, P PPC 64 LE base container images that are available on Docker Hub. So you can go and grab them. Um, there is also multi platform Docker uh, recipes. If you go to uh, uh, E4S, uh, and, and um, you can grab these for a variety of platforms. And reproducible Docker recipes as well that are, are available. All of this is available on GitHub. And then I mentioned the virtual box image, which uh, contains runtimes for Docker Shifter, Singularity, and Charlie Cloud. Um, do you want to say anything more about the container based uh, uh, capabilities? So the virtual box image is uh, useful for just trying it on your own laptops. For instance, if you have VirtualBox installed, you may want to learn more about Charlie Cloud or Singularity or Shifter. Uh, and this allows you to experiment with it right on your laptop. Thank you, Samir. All right, and then E4S CL is a command launch tool I mentioned um, that allows you to uh, be able to replace that uh, uh, on a given system you know, the, the containerized version of MPI with the system specific uh, version of MPI, which can, you know, dramatically improve your performance. And so that tool is available too. And this is just a little bit of more of the details. Anything you want to say here, Samir? In the hands-on session, we will show how we have built an application with uh, MPH and we replaced the MPH with uh, Intel MPI. So Intel MPI is often used on many HPC uh, centers and it will allow you to just easily form the arguments and just launch the binary and replace the MPI so that you can get good internode uh, network performance while still keeping the same executable. Thanks. Very nice, a very powerful feature. Okay, just a little bit about continuing this integration. Remember, um, you know, the, the first two of those three questions was, you know, how do, can we satisfy the key performance parameter within ECP? Uh, and, and it's very important for us to be able to test our software as we're developing it and test it not only on um, you know, more general purpose hardware, but as we approach the exascale systems, the testing systems that, that we have that are precursors to these exascale platforms. And, you know, continuous integration is, um, it, you know, the value proposition of it is that you want to minimize the amount of time between a fault being injected into your software stack and its detection, because that allows you to more quickly you know, uh, detect exactly what went wrong and fix it before it propagates further in time and in space. 
And, and so we made a, a big investment. And I think one of the, the revolutionary aspects of the work that we're doing with E4S is our relationship between um, the so people who are developing reusable software in DOE and the computing facilities that need to use that. Um, we're building new relations, we're build building new workflows that are fundamentally different than what were possible before. And, and so we have this validation test suite. Um, you know, admittedly right now, many of them are pretty you know, generic types of calls, um, but as their teams are creating capabilities, targeting the Exascale platforms, these, these uh, validation tests are becoming um, you know, more uh, substantial and consequential, testing cardinal features uh, that we need to have work well on these new Exascale platforms. But again, this is all on GitHub. You can go and find these things. We have a process for adding to that. Anything else you wanna say about this, Samir? It's important to not only compile the program with the set of libraries, it's also important to run some validation test cases before we release the software. And also to do a clean sweep across multiple products as they are installed to see that they can interoperate properly in a consistent manner. So before we do our release, we run through this whole, uh, you know, validation suite. And this does not replace the individual SPAC test functionality in individual products, but in fact allows us to test an ensemble of products together. Very good, thank you. Thank you. Um, and then, you know, we have reproducible container builds uh, using E4S base images. Um, so anything more you want to say about this, Samir? With the base images, you can cherry pick the packages that you really want to install. And in this case, we have just picked SuperLU, Dist, Petsy, MFEM, Strumpack, Butterfly Pack, OpenBlast, and created a smaller container using these base images. And so we have recipes, we have a, a, a set of commands that you need to run with creating a Docker container. And we'll go through some of these examples ourselves in the tutorial. Thank you. And then we also have GitLab runner images. Um, what do you wanna say about this, Samir? So these images are used for running our continuous integration workflows. Uh, on various systems on Frank at the University of Oregon and other sites. And they allow us to just uh, customize the builds of Docker and then run the workflows for specific uh, products. So thanks. Thanks. Keep going, you're on a roll. And this is just a, a snapshot of how we are using the GitLab continuous integration for creating the E4S builds for many different platforms. And you can see that this is uh, showing you various operating systems that we are building for. And you'll see the products pushed to the build cache that uh, Mike showed earlier. Thanks. Yeah, and then I'll say a few things here and let Samir talk. So one of the sure. more exciting things that we've, uh, uh, stood up and, and recognizes the creation of a, of a multi-node uh, system that has as many mostly non-NDA devices um, with a shared file system. We call this thing Frank for Frankenstein, but it's, it's emerged as an incredible resource for software technology teams to be able to bring their software to a single multi-node uh, system and be able to do things like create, uh, you know, SPAC recipes and try out, you know, a new feature on a variety of different target devices. Uh, and then also for our own testing capabilities, uh, which I think, uh, you know, Samir, you want to mention a few things, right? Sure. And you can see that we have tags in the GitLab instances. So there's a tag for A100 and DG1 for Intel DG1 discrete GPU or the MI50 AMD GPU. And uh, when a SPAC uh, pull request is merged, the Kitware build pipeline spawns off these jobs. And based on those tags, whether it's a tag like Cooper Lake platform or one with uh, AMD GPU, the jobs get routed to these systems on Frank where runners are installed and you can 
uh, execute those. So we have thousands of jobs flowing through SPAC pull requests, which come to Frank in a production manner. Now these machines are quite uh, quite capable of handling large loads. And so we are also using these machines for our own development uh, uh, purposes. And if you would like to get access to uh, a GPU of one of these vendors and it's harder for you to get access on other sites, please reach out to me and we'll enable your access to these machines as well. So you can try out uh, with the GPUs. Thank you, Samir. All right, you wanna keep going with the build pipelines? And these build pipelines are not just uh, available at the University of Oregon. Here is an example of the build pipelines where they are creating binaries at uh, MERSC uh, on the Cori system. And here is one on the Ascent system at Oak Ridge, which is a mini summits like system where you can easily uh, enable GitLab runners so we can create uh, the facility uh, binaries and, and then push them to local build caches. And we also have badges for various products uh, where we can specify what kind of license check they have had or which version of SPAC and, and so on. And so these badges are available on the E4S project uh, web page on GitHub as well. Thank you, Samir. All right, so we have uh, just a couple more topics uh, before we wrap it up in the intro part here. Um, the first thing I want to talk a bit about is uh, E4S community engagement. Uh, <clears throat> so we, we have found in general E4S is, uh, but because of its portfolio approach has allowed us to have communicate or uh, relationships um, with the rest of the HPC community that were just not possible before. You, you couldn't have a single product team have a relationship with a facility or with you know, the, o, o, the LLVM community. You know, we, it takes this kind of aggregate and portfolio approach in order to establish you know, new ways of working in the HBC community. And that's what we've been able to realize and you know, much to our you know, uh, great satisfaction. Um, in addition, E4S provides some incentives and support for high quality research software products. You know, we have these community policies that drive expectations for uh, uh, quality. We have the SDKs for it, uh, teams in similar domains to interact with each other and, and create compatibility across the work and learn best practices. And then because of the doc portal and our building and testing capabilities, we have transparency that shows how well teams are doing and again, drives them to succeed and helps them to succeed. And, and can even say whether or not a product is you know, a good one or, or a poor one. And we can give indications of that to the broader community. And, and then finally, um, one of the most exciting aspects of it is if, a new, if a, there's a new product that's really valuable, we have a new uh, Arbor X is a quite new geometric search library. Um, it's part of E4S, it's available at the doc portal, it's tested regularly on a lot of platforms. Anywhere E4S gets installed, ArborX gets installed. Um, <clears throat> and, and without E4S, ArborX would be this small library sitting at Oak Ridge and would really struggle, at least our past experience would say it would struggle to be able to get noticed and get out there and get people finding out about how to use it and getting it installed. And so what we've been able to do with E4S so far is provide this kind of direct path for software teams to reach their users and stakeholders. Um, and we're very excited about that. <clears throat> so you might wonder how you can join E4S. How can your product be a part of of what we're doing. Well, the prerequisite is just has to make technical sense, you know, we're, we're and we have to, you know, reason about what that means and it probably expand that as time goes on. Um, and then level zero is, is simply to have, you know, use SPAC. We, we can't build your product unless you have SPAC enabled uh, to build it. Um, and then you can add it to our doc portal. That's really just add, giving us a URL that we can point to. Um, you might want to iterate on as we try to render your README file and your you know, license file to make sure it renders properly on the E4S doc portal. And then as time goes on, you know, we're asking our own teams and we would expect that you, know, you can satisfy our, our 
community policy, which is our quality commitment. But those are being stood up in real time. And so you know, we're evolving them as we go. <clears throat> we do try to reach out to the broader community. We had in September a workshop on E4S. And, and the, the point here is to see the different you know, non-DOE participants in that workshop, including you know, folks from uh, uh, you know, parts outside of the United States, other parts, other agencies. Uh, and um, and the leadership computing facilities. So just a summary, what it what about you for us? What is not? It's not a closed system. Instead, it's a, an it's an extensible open architecture, accepting contributions from the U.S. international communities. Uh, it's a framework for collaborative open source product integration for ECP and beyond. And we foresee that E4S as it's structured now can increasingly embrace AI uh, capabilities. But as I said, we already have PyTorch, TensorFlow, and Horovod. We, we also foresee that you know, as DOE makes an investment in AI for science, that the products and the tools that come out of the R&D in DOE can be incorporated into E4S. DOE also has an effort in quantum computing, and there will need to be a software stack for that, and that we can participate in providing that software uh, to the user community. Uh, E4S is not monolithic. Uh, we provide everything, but then you can also, because of the nature of SPAC in particular, be able to pick just a subtree of what we build and have confidence that it will build uh, for you as a subtree. It's not a commercial product. We are not in the business of trying to compete with industry. Instead, what we want to do is reduce the gap between the work that we do uh, in E4S and, and uh, someone who can make a business from it. <clears throat> and, and so we, we welcome that inner kind of interaction. Uh, and it's also more than a simple packaging of, of existing software. You know, the SDKs provide this nice communal experience for similarly similar products. And, and it's also a conduit for, you know, leading future leading edge software uh, capabilities. All right, just a little bit about looking forward and then we can take a break here and take any questions if you have any. Um, so what are some lessons learned? Um, deliver DOE software as a reusable portfolio. You know, it's already E4S is more than the value of the sum of its parts and all the ways that we mentioned, the doc portal. Um, E4S is ready to extend, as we mentioned, uh, to other capabilities. Um, and it's becoming, you know, this first class uh, entity in the software ecosystem. And that's what we're really excited about going forward, even past uh, the end of ECP. Um, we do have some challenges, I think, uh, you know, so ECP is a, you know, very robust tailored, you know, 413.3b federally funded construction project which had very rigorous, uh, you know, uh, controls in place that we've been able to benefit from, uh, you know, that allow us to, to construct something, you know, over a multiple sp uh, span of multiple years, you know, transitioning and adapting this infrastructure Past the end of PC of ECP will be challenging. You know they're you know they're they're uh, you know uh, independent of creating yet another you know four thirteen point three b project. We have to I uh, figure out how can we keep this thing going, and and so um, you know we're working on that. We're working on that with DOE with other uh, stakeholders in the community. Um, but the opportunities are to have this sustainable software ecosystem for HPC software. And, and our payoff is we can get better, faster, and cheaper all at the same time. That's our hope going forward too. Um, the other thing is that you know, we, we understood what we can do well. We can make high quality HPC products. Uh, we, through the community policies, we can improve quality. Uh, doc portal provide ac access to documentation, testing, this curated collection, this turnkey stack. You know, what, what we're not well suited to do right now is how do we support new features that are not part of our core mission? We have to figure out a way of co considering that. How do we sustain support of new customers? You know, how do we uh, inter interact with the commercial software enterprise? And how do we sustain maintenance only products that are no longer funded for R&D? And so we need to explore business uh, models for these gaps as we go forward. All right, final points. Um, so E4S is this curated stack. 
Um, we're starting to plan uh, past the end of ECP. Uh, we think E4S has reduced important gaps, but some gaps remain. And we're committed to characterizing the gaps and closing them and plan and execute towards sustainability. Um, and then some opportunities for interaction. E4S is ready for you to use now. And we would welcome your interaction. We hope that in the hands-on uh, setting that you'll be able to get some good experience with it. Uh, we would love to engage with new software teams who are interested in it. Um, if you're interested in more of the R&D and the research side of things, we have a workshop that uh, a lot of ECP uh, software technology team members are participating in on scientific software or focuses on software teams. So this website can bring you to that page in case you want to sign up as a participant as part of that. And then I'll leave you with this uh, slide here, which is a pointer to our capability assessment report that goes into a lot of detail about the products and E4S uh, that are part of uh, our efforts here for ECP. And I'll stop. Thank you. So we have some time for questions here. I think it probably would work for people to just unmute and ask a question, or if you're uncomfortable with that, type it in the chat and we'll repeat back. Well, people are thinking that, Mike, I had a question about, you know, the, the whole idea of containers should make it easy for people to deploy this in an environment, their system to try it out. Do you have a little advice about how somebody goes about that? Yes, Samir, do you want to take that? You have the most experience. Sure. So with containers, you know, you can install Singularity on your HPC system and uh, just download the Singularity image and say Singularity run. I'll show examples of this in our hands-on, and I would encourage all of you to stay on for the hands-on session. We have made it uh, simple enough that uh, each one will get their own instance, and you just have to cut and paste the instructions into a window, but just doing it yourself once and looking through the commands will help you understand the concepts much better. So it's not very complex. We don't expect uh, a, a lot of input from you. We just want you to try the hands-on sessions. And these are self-paced sessions where you'll see how to deploy the containers and how to actually build the containers yourself. Good, thanks. There, there's a question in the chat. I, I think he's saying that they he couldn't unmute himself. I think yeah, Osni there's is- a second, There's a second question that, that's typed in. Oh yeah, right, okay. So I, I did, uh, I changed the settings here. So participants, I, I allow participants to unmute themselves. Yeah, I will well, be I, able to, oh, I'm good. unmuted now. Yeah, go ahead. Oh, there you go. go. Ahead, okay. yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. I mean, I guess I'll just ask my question. So um, I'm still a little unclear about what E4S is providing. Do you provide a container with SPAC in it? And then we would be expected to build our software within the container or do you provide something that would have SPAC, that would have something like NetCDF built with SPAC, and then we can use SPAC to build other libraries that we want? Yeah, Samir, you wanna take that again? So yeah. uh, our containers have uh, a full featured containers where we have built the entire software stack using SPAC. So SPAC is embedded inside the container and it has uh, 70 odd different packages pre-built with a, a consistent compiler MPI and that you can just use uh, directly. And uh, you also have the option of using base mm -hmm. container images and creating your own customized containers, which are much smaller using our build cache. And we'll show an example of building a full ECP application, which uh, does not need the full container, but uses parts of it and uses SPAC to create your, its own customized image. We'll build both Docker and Singularity images for this and run it. We'll also run the same ECP application on the AWS system. So uh, we'll look at all the steps one by one and we'll start from the very basics where we don't expect any prior knowledge of HPC build systems and go step by step. 
we have time today and tomorrow. So I, I encourage you all to stay for the hands-on session for that. Did I answer your question? Um, I, I think so. <laughs> uh, as a follow-up, so there is some, um, some talk about, you know, you support one API. Do you, are there one API containers available? Yes. In fact, if you download the container from the e4s.io webpage, you will find that it has not only one API, but also Rockam and CUDA all in the same container. So you oh, wow. can just use a module load Intel and then just get started with that. In fact, uh, one of the hands-on sessions uh, I have shows how you can use TensorFlow and PyTorch from one API on the AWS instance on the Intel Xeon Platinum processors. Uh, the other question that I had was there, I'm sorry, I'm asking so many questions. No, there were, uh, <laughs> that's uh, why there, we're here. Yeah, yeah, right. There was a slide that had support for, and it said C++ and PI. Uh, it did not say Fortran. Do, do you have extensive support for Fortran as well? We do. We have extensive support for Fortran. We have G Fortran compilers. We have the LLVM. DOE fork of LLVM where we have the Flang and F18 compilers. You'll find the full stack over there. We have vendor compilers, including Intel Fortran. We have support for AMD and other architectures as well. So we have a range of Fortran uh, compilers as well as products, Fortran APIs for various products too. So yes. Wow, that's great. That's great, yeah. Yeah, and, and let me let me say something about Fortran because um, if you're if you're a Fortran uh, user, uh, we we and you're not already speaking out about this. Um, I, I think Fortran has an existential issue um, nowadays uh, in 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 being a robust ecosystem in in the sense that it's becoming much harder for vendors. To support, you know, standalone Fortran front end, back end, and and in fact, most of them in the C C plus plus realm have are switching to Clang, you know, Clang L and LLVM for C and C plus plus. They want to do the same for Flang. There's a you know F eighteen Flang, uh, for, you know, a community front end, and ECP is you know investing substantially to make to help Flang succeed. Uh, but but we also need other people who care about Fortran to you know step up and 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 be active. Um, I, I worry about Fortran in that you know it's as I said it's harder for vendors from generation of to generation, especially as we get to more advanced devices that are not just x86 you know CPUs that it's harder for them to make the business case to invest a lot of resources in Fortran. It's not like it will go away. But will it be the latest features? Will it really be you know bug free and performant and those kinds of things? So you know we would appreciate anybody who's interested in Fortran you know to to reach out to us and help us make sure that Flang succeeds because Flang is I think the way that Fortran will remain robust. Um, there's a question here from uh, Andy Gallo. So. Um, Let's see, I'll read it here. Uh, each abstraction for portability comes with some performance cost. Some users may not be willing to pay the cost because perhaps because they don't understand the value. Any experience making good arguments for abstractions with a performance first user group? Um, that's, a, that's a good question. Um, well, my, my, my first response is I don't want to convince them in a certain way, you know, it com you know completely because in the end, that has to be their choice. Um, the, you know, they have to make the kind of cost benefit trade off. If they have a lot of resources and they're able to do, you know, uh, custom build, you know, uh, custom uh, source for each uh, art tar target. And, you know, it's really important that they have that and they don't mind, say, the code divergence, code duplication from platform to platform. Then, then that's a business choice that they're making. Now, if they if they're not if they're doing that because they don't know that it might be cheaper and and effective to use a portability abstraction, that that I think we're making some progress on. You know, as Samir mentioned, you know, we can provide E4S for all of these different target architectures, and and by just simply 
um, you know, using our containers, you can try it out. And, and for a much lower cost than in the past, you'll be able to try out these abstraction layers and at least get some reasonable sense of whether or not they, your business model would support using them versus having to write all of your own instances without the abstraction layer. So we're trying to help in that way. We also have performance portability libraries that are included in E4S, such as uh, Raja and Cocos for node level parallelism, where you can express the parallelism in your program in a performance portable way uh, using C++ <laughs> templates. And uh, we have tools like Tau and Papi that can be used to evaluate the performance of your code. We'll also see this in the hands-on session. How, how we can do that without any modifications to your binary. Uh, Samir. Um, go ahead, please. Uh, do you know how can we debug inside the container using Tau? Yes, uh, if you are looking at performance uh, issues, you can use Tau, which is part of the container and you can just launch the application. We'll show you examples of this. We have even GUI mm -hmm. tools like Paraprof that work from within the Singularity container. And uh, we also include uh, other uh, features like uh, debuggers that are included as part of the vendor stacks, as well as uh, GDB uh, and other debuggers that are included in the container. So you can debug your code for correctness as well as performance. So you can uh, measure the overheads for containers as well, like instantiation overheads. So if you're wondering about uh, making performance experiments on bare metal versus running the same code within a container, then mm -hmm. you have the ability to do that. In fact, on our AWS instance, you'll be able to launch an application uh, with the bare metal install of uh, E4S and uh, run it. And then also try the same example, uh, say the NAS parallel benchmark and run it inside the container and see the difference in the the costs and you can also uh, look at the performance using tau inside or outside the container and compare those two did i okay. answer your question yeah i'll try that <laughs> i'll try thank okay, you okay great so there, there are a couple Glad more questions there are a couple more questions in the chat i'll um, read from andy wissink um is it possible to bring into e4s a software package that is developed by a university but is not open source and is subject to non-redistribution restrictions. Um, we actually have a, a, a challenge from our, we have this independent project review in February um, from one of our reviewers to look at business models and technical models that would you know, support as best we can these kinds of situations. Um, you know, because it's really a blended you know, technical business situation and we don't have a good answer for for you now but it's one of our requirements to respond to this kind of question uh before the next I, independent project review which will be within the next year so i don't have a good answer for you now but it is something that we are looking at and trying to understand how we can uh support in in some way that kind of situation and, and I would like to add to that, uh, Andy, that if you have a containerized workflow and you wanted to use a full featured E4S container yeah. and add yeah. to that, yes. or if you had a bare metal uh, you know, install <clears throat> with E4S or uh, use a, you know, a base container from E4S to build your own custom container, you are free to export that on Docker Hub and have other people download that as a, something that you just add on to what we already provide. So that may be another model that might work. Even if it's not part of E4S, you can publish all of uh, the products that you develop using E4S because uh, our software is not restricted. Right. Yeah, Did I answer your question? I'm out of interest in time, I'm going to do this last one last one from Craig Bozma. Any comments on the value of using uh, SPAC E4S mm -hmm. in a more heterogeneous environment 
for instance, with legacy proprietary codes or open source packages that exist outside the E4REST ecosystem that may support other package management systems. Samir, you want to take that? Sure. Uh, so we do have support for many different operating systems, and each of them comes with their own package management systems. And SPAC can coexist with them. SPAC does not require root access like um, yum or the apt package manager you can install the full software stack and run everything in the user space so they can coexist you can have some packages that are installed from the other package manager and in fact spac allows you to find the external packages you can say spac external find and it will locate those packages you can specify a externally installed package and then use it along with other spac packages so that uh, ability to interoperate is very important. And then you're not stuck with a platform specific program uh, package manager. You can use the same package manager across all the different operating systems or architectures. I hope we answered your question, Craig. And if we haven't answered your questions fully, 